I sh share my screen now? Yes, oh. please. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. And uh, Jay is going to talk about whether do public policies promote equality of opportunity for well being. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, okay, just a minute. I should go back. Okay, thank you very much. So this is going to be a, a big change from the previous one in terms of content. It's a paper which is a very, you know, it's very much empirically oriented and uh, coming from a quantitative uh, perspective of uh, looking at what, what can, or how can we kind of you know, evaluate or assess equality. Uh, so this is a joint paper with Ricardo Nogales, who was my ex-PhD student, who is at the University of Oxford now. So this is about uh, com combination. And in fact, he, he, earlier I was talking about friendships. This is a one another friendship, a combination of different approaches to equality and well-being. So there are two big uh, words here, uh, equality. So we're going to ask what equality are we going to talk about? And well-being, what is the concept of well-being that we're going to use for defining equality or not? And then there will be an exa empirical example on, uh, on um, uh, using Bolivian data. So the overview of the presentation is this. First, a little bit of background. Then I go to the theoretical framework. And as I uh, said earlier, this going to, it's based on an econometric modeling. Uh, then the econometric strategy implementation and then application and with end with some concluding remarks. So we start with the um, with the um, idea that the recent theories, more modern theories of development and well-being, acknowledge the fact that the policies should be aiming at not necessarily, you know, um, equalizing outcomes but equalizing opportunities for achieving outcomes. So equalization of what is the equalization of opportunities for well-being. And so we combine this, with this idea, we combine two different approaches. One is saying, what is well-being? The other is saying, what is a policy that aims to equalize opportunities for well-being? So coming from the well-being perspective, uh, point of view, uh, again, there's a wide consensus that well-being is a multi, uh, recently, in the recent years, that their well-being is a multi-dimensional concept, that one should be going beyond economic dimension uh, to cover all aspects of life, all aspects that people have reason to value and people have can consider as important uh, in the definition of what is a good life is all about. So we say that that well-being should be not just economic, not just income, but also social, political, everything. And we're going to come back to this. So this is called the capability approach. And it was uh, the, one of the pioneers of this approach is Amartya Sen. But also there are other uh, philosophers who have contributed to this approach. So this says it's not only it's multidimensional, but it is all about uh, opportunities. It's about the ability of people. This has a, its own jargon of terms, but it's, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to minimize the jargon as much as possible. So it's about well-being. It's not just well-being, but potential well-being, what the ability of people, what could people do and be like, you know, in terms of be educated, be healthy, uh, have, be employed and things like that. So what the ability, the opportunities for people to do and be things. And these are what are called capabilities in this approach. And they are kind of counterfactual in nature because obviously you don't observe all that people could do. We only observe what they have actually achieved in their lives. So other things they could have done, for example, I mean, even if you take the example of this lecture, you could have not been, you know, you could have been somewhere else during this lecture. So you had other possibilities and you chose the possibilities of being at the workshop. So you don't observe the, all the possibilities that you did choose. And so this is by kind of its nature, it's a counterfactual in nature, this concept of capabilities, what people could achieve. And then the, the idea is to say that this is what we want to equalize. Equalize 
people's opportunities to do things and people's capability sets. Capability sets in all dimensions. So not just in the economic dimension, but also in the social dimension, the political dimension, in the environmental dimension, dimension you know, to be in a clean environment, to have a, a good social relations, to be, you know, emotionally stable or, you know, healthy and, and, and physically healthy. So all dimensions to, uh, to equalize capability sets of individuals in all dimensions. That's coming from this approach, that would be the equality concept. Uh, and then what is a good, what is a good policy that will aim at, uh, 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 at, at least enable equality in this in this way and that we take what another you know very important um, uh, approach in the in the equality and inequality literature which is the equality of opportunity approach which was developed by john romer again one of the pioneers is john romer who said that any outcome any well-being outcome and this is more this approach is more used in the unidimensional literature more but we are actually going to apply this combined that's why we are combining capability approach with this so we're going to combine this take this approach and apply it in the multi-dimensional setting this approach it says that normally any outcome is a result of many things but it should not be like effort, the people's uh, the effort that people put in, but it should not be if there is equality of opportunity that people's circumstances should not matter for what they achieve as their well-being. So to be uh, equal to the, the circumstances are some things are defined as things that are beyond an individual control, like gender, for example. So it should not matter what gender one person is provided both men and women put the same effort or have the same, you know, uh, um, same uh, capabilities, they should be able to achieve the same things, irrespective of what their circumstances are. So effort, equal effort should lead to equal rewards, and circumstances should not determine the outcomes. And if circumstances do matter, then there is inequality of opportunity. So this is the these are the two concepts, the major concepts that we are trying to we are, we are combining. And as I explained, the first uh, approach is capabilities. Capabilities are defined as opportunities and choices that people have to lead the life that they have reason to value. This is the kind of uh, the formal definition of it. But as I was explaining it, just to say that, you know, it's what people can achieve, potential outcomes, let's say, potential well-being. And the actual well-being achieved because of the particular choices made is called well-being. And in this jargon, it's called functionings. That is, they say beings and doings, you're healthy, you're educated to a certain level and so on uh, and then capability set is the set of potential achievements in all dimensions so it's a multi-dimensional concept uh, now go to the equality of opportunity or inequality of opportunity uh, according to john romer this any outcome well-being outcome here is a result of three things circumstances as i said these are factors that are beyond individual control like gender race color you know, family background, you don't control the family that you are born into and things like that. So these are circumstances. Efforts, of course, these are deliberate decisions taken by the individual, how much effort you want to put in and, and, and things like that. And then, of course, there's always the luck part, a random shocks. So uh, when there is, we say that there is equality of opportunity when, as I said, circumstances do not play any role in the determination of outcome, either directly so it should not matter whether one is of a particular race, particular color, particular gender, and or indirectly even via the efforts because of the fact that sometimes if you are a person of a, a certain color knows that how much ever uh, effort that she puts in, she might end up with a lower outcome, then it might in fact discourage her from putting uh, you know, a, a adequate effort. So that's an indirect effect of circumstances on the effort, which ultimately leads to a lower outcome. So either circumstances should not matter either directly or indirectly by discouraging efforts because knowing, anticipating a lower outcome. So that means what, e so if circumstances don't matter, so that means if two people, persons put equal effort then they should be getting an equal reward independent of the circumstances and that's the concept of leveling the playing field so how to verify this in practice or how to go about operationalizing these things in practice so in the equality of opportunity literature there are two ways that it is done so people are a population is divided into different groups of individuals characterized by different circumstances 
So a group of individual is characterized by the same set of circumstances. They're called types, in this literature. So by the same you know, age group, gender, and other things. And then we examine if the equal effort in these different types gives rise to the same reward or not across these types. If they not, if they don't give rise to the same reward, then we say there is inequality of opportunity. That's one way of looking at it, dividing the population into homogeneous circumstance sets. The other way is to just do a regression of well-being outcomes on circumstance variables as well as efforts and check if the coefficients of the circumstances are significant or not. If they are significant, then there is inequality of opportunity. These are the two major ways in which the equality of opportunity um, concept is applied in practice. And in, normally in this literature, as I said, people look at a single outcome, which is mostly income. So they look at an outcome such as income and see if that depends on circumstance variables as well as efforts. And sometimes even efforts is hard to observe. So that's uh, merged into the random, random shock term. So now having uh, and most of the uh, most of the time we do uh, observe that there is inequality of opportunity that is circumstances do matter so then how will you look at a public policy what should a public policy do to reduce inequality of opportunity it should aim to reduce the effect of circumstance on outcome and so a not we say a public policy is optimal is something that completely eliminates the impact of circumstance on outcome and we'll see that in an example so just a, a picture saying that if you say equal resources, if you give equal resources to people who are differently, you know, who have different circumstances, here the circumstances, simple saying that the height of the individual, then if they are, uh, if you give them equal, if they are equally, you know, equal, if you distribute the out, uh, resources equally, then obviously people who need, uh, all people will not be able to achieve the same outcome. So that's equality in resources or equality in, in, um, in uh, yeah, resources. And so what we are saying is that's not what we want. So in order to have social justice or fairness, you should be uh, offsetting the impact of circumstances. Policy should be offsetting the impact of circumstances. Here being a shorter person should be given a bigger stool so that they, all of them can watch the, the match. And so in this paper, we are com combining the two in the sense that we keep the concept of equality of opportunity, but we say opportunity for what? Opportunities for well-being in a multi-dimensional concept and then we uh, we kind of say why uh, there is compatibility between these two uh, these two approaches and they can be uh, combined and operationalized to check if uh, whether public policies are uh, reducing uh, inequality so now uh, so in this uh, the, in the theoretical framework so we we set up a model and as i said it's also going to be a simultaneous equation the expected outcome is a function of circumstances, efforts, uh, F is the efforts, and public policies. Of course, circumstances and public policies can be merged, but we, got, we are looking at policies and see if they are optimal or not. So we are going to give a separate um, you know, name to that, symbol to that. And as I said, efforts can themselves de be dependent on circumstances. So there may be an endogenous endogeneity here. So we take that into account. And then this is expected, there's all possibilities, and this, this, the, the outcome is one possible outcome among different things that people could have had in terms of capabilities. So we say that this Y is a particular choice, a particular vector, it's multidimensional, so you have outcomes in the different dimensions of life, uh, lifestyle dimensions, like, you know, material income, wealth, edu in wealth, education, health, other things, social relations. So this is a vector, and this is a particular vector out of all possible, other possible vectors that they could have had, but we don't, may not observe it, so we're going to take it as latent variables. And these are determined by the resources that people have, their own resources, efforts, as well as what they have at, as uh, circumstances. So the model is this, so they, they, in the, they achieved what, the, what we observed as achieved outcomes are, combi uh, are a product of efforts as well as what they could, the choice set they had. And this is determined by circumstances among which we are going to isolate public policies to see whether, see circumstances, the equality of opportunity means that there should not be any arrow between circumstance. Well, there's social circumstances, family circumstances, and individual, as I said, color, race, and other things. 
So normally these arrows should be non-existent. If there is equality of opportunities, they should not be influencing. And we do observe they do influence. So what we are trying to see is whether these public policies, how much they reduce the strength of this influence between the social circumstance and efforts or capabilities or opportunity sets. So the, effort, the, the Y is a, is a particular choice of the Q. Q is the capability set, which is this. So why that we observed here, observe here is a particular choice, is a particular outcome out of the choice set. And then of course that has been achieved through efforts. The choice set is uh, dependent on each other. The capabilities influence each other. They are dependent on the circumstances. They are dependent on the efforts and they're dependent on public policies because public policies do influence the surrounding factors. And then the efforts themselves, as I said, could be dependent on them. So this is the, is the framework, and then we're going to put it into an econometric model. I may be skipping a few of these. So this is just to say that the because of the counterfactual nature of capabilities, as well as efforts, because we may not be able to observe all the efforts that people put in, we're going to assume them to be latent. That is not observed, directly observed, but we may have certain indirect measurements of that, you know, like efforts, the number of years of schooling and the number of year, hours of study and things like that. If you're looking at an educational outcome, capabilities that what are the choice sets that they had, while the choice sets will be dependent on the resources they had. So we may be having measurements of these things, but not fully, they're not directly observable. They are mutually influencing each other. That comes from the simultaneity of the model. And they are obviously influenced by circumstances. The X is the vector of circumstances. And the T, the key uh, parameter to be examined is the T, which is, it looks at the, which is the impact of circumstances on these capabilities, efforts, and other things. So the T, how much, if the T ideally should be zero, they should not matter. But of course, the T do, does, I mean, the Xs do matter. And so we have some in, in a significant uh, T, T values. But then do public policies uh, help in reducing this impact at least? And that's what we are, we are looking at. So if public policies are achieve at least to reduce the impact of T, then that means they are at least working towards equality of opportunity. So the public, the T is a function of the policy variables. And that's what we want to find out whether how much the policy variable is uh, uh, is uh, the counters the effect of the circumstances. Then if you look at the effect of the circumstances, we can ca calculate the effect of the circumstances as a function of the public policies and see that if the public policy has to counter it, then the, these two have to be of opposite signs. And that's so, so if the, but the we, we define the policy to be contributing to an attenuation of unfair inequalities of opportunities if the beta parameter and the delta parameter have opposite signs. So if beta is positive, delta is negative, that means that is going to reduce its impact, right? And then an ideal policy is something which makes it zero. The excess should not impact on the capabilities or the effort. So that an ideal, the up, we will define an optimal policy to be one which completely annihilates or offsets the effect of circumstances. Okay, now we go to the empirical example. We use the household survey. Mind you, most of these surveys are secondary data. We don't have primary data in terms of we didn't we don't do the surveys ourselves and most of the time my, our applications or my applications have always been in the context of developing countries to say that although the model looks a little bit sophisticated and developing countries may not have and of course in the case of capabilities it's developed or developing countries, there are very few countries which have data on capabilities. So most of the countries don't have data on capabilities. So that's why we take them to be latent variables. But we want to show that in spite of the kind of complexity of the model, we can use the information that is already available and derive useful policy insights. Okay, the public policy variables are the public expenditure on infrastructure like sanitation, water, electricity, roads, and communication, and the public expenditure on social services like education and health. These are the policy variables that you are looking at. And the circumstances we are looking at are gender, ethnicity, uh, their ethnicity is basically indigenous, non-indigenous, age, and family background. That is whether the household is, head is educated or not. To a certain extent, rural, although it's sometimes not considered to be a circumstance because people can choose to be in a rural or urban. But the main four circumstances are gender, ethnicity, age, and family background. And normally, these shouldn't matter provided 
they if a gen, uh, ethnicity uh, some any non indigenous and an indigenous person putting in the same effort should be uh, normally uh, you no know, should have the same outcome that's the idea so what are the the, the outcome variables that we have one is the material conditions, but since we say it's, we don't want to just the material, we also have what uh, what is called the life satisfaction uh, measure. So material conditions of living are basically, you know, the residence quality, ceilings, walls, floors, basic living conditions, drinking water, do they have access to drinking water, electricity, cooking, well, how, what kind of, do they have access to clean cooking fuel, residency equipment, telephone, mobile internet, crowding, the number of bedrooms per members. And then there's the subjective uh, well-being, which is, are they satisfied with their uh, wealth, with their with their community relations, with the environment that they live in, and with their uh, affection within the family? So this is the similar, uh, I mean, the Bolivian case, which is exactly similar to what we saw before. And so just some 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 illustrations of examples. And as I said, we do always observe that the circumstance matters. So if you take the circumstance of being of belonging to the indigenous community, you say you see that this has a negative impact on the material conditions of living. So indigenous communities just, I mean, for equal effort, huh? because effort variable is in there. So for equal effort, indigenous communities tend to achieve a lower outcome than non-indigenous communities. And you can even see that they also influences the effort they put in indigenous communities tend to put in lower effort because of the fact, as I said, an anticipated lower outcome, irrespective, I mean, whatever be the effort they put in. So the, it also affects indirectly. So there is, the first observation is there is inequality of opportunity. Do these expenditures, public policies, do they offset that inequality of opportunity? Well, in the case of material conditions, the infrastructure expenditure doesn't do very much, but the social expenditure seems to help in the sense of the the the, the ne negative is offset by this the positive interaction coefficient, so that means the net effect will be reduced by the net effect of being endogenous is reduced if there is some social expenditure by the state. So the being so the 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 reading of this table is that being gen indigenous generates inequality of opportunity. In fact, most of the inequality of opportunity is direct. There is some which is indirect going through the effort and then the effort effect of effort on conditions, 84% direct and 16%, only 16% is indirect. Social expenditure seems to contribute to reduce this unfair inequality because the fact that being indigenous shouldn't matter. Uh, well, I'm going to skip this because of the time. And we also show uh, the individual heterogeneity is there. So there's a whole distribution of the impact. And that impact, if you reduce, we simulated scenarios to say if you if you reduce expenditures, obviously the impact is going to be much higher. So the uh, uh, reduction of the expenditure, social expenditure by the state is going to aggravate the inequality of opportunity. So it is clear that there is inequality of opportunity. And uh, if you look at the another bag, uh, circumstance variable, which is a family background, Again, something beyond an individual control. And that we have, for example, an illustration, parent schooling, parents education level. Again, that does seem to matter. So normally a child born into an educated household seems to achieve, irrespective, again, putting in the same effort, seems to achieve a better outcome than a child born into an uneducated household or a household with parents uneducated, which should not be the case. Now here, both the social expenditures, public policy variables seem to have a good impact or a significant impact. They seem to reduce the, 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 the effect of the schooling variable, the parent schooling variable. So they, they have the opposite signs. So they seem to uh, eliminate, now there's not eliminate, they seem to attenuate the, uh, the uh, equal inequality of opportunity due to this effect of the family background, but they don't necessarily completely eliminate it because they don't completely offset this coefficient. Here, the contribution of indirect the direct seems to be you know, a very different configuration. 40, only 45% of the effect is direct, 55% comes through indirect. So people, children, uh, uh, born uh, children born into families with uh, you know a uh, low level of education of the parents seems to put in lower efforts and that also obviously uh, contributes to a lower outcome so both the policy variables seem to reduce in the case of bolivia here again some graphics to show the same thing 
again, some simulations to show that if you did reduce the infrastructure or social expenditure, you'll end up in a much worse situation. To say that they do matter, the whole distribution itself is tilted. So not just average, because the regressions give us an average outcome, average impact, but even if you look at the distribution of impact for all individuals, that seems to be the case. The whole distribution shifts slides. Now, do they actually completely eliminate? As we said, no. How much of expenditure is needed to eliminate? The current expenditure is $5 per year per person. You need $31, for example, to completely offset the uh, uh, the disadvantage doing, due to being indigenous. So it's almost five, six times the expenditure that is needed to completely offset the unfairness due to, due to, uh, social, due to the circumstance variables. So what we conclude, the capability approach as well as the equality of opportunity approach can be com combined to be an operationalized to look at whether uh, policies are contributing to reducing the equality of opportunity and we, cannot, we have also explicitly modeled the role of efforts because most of the time the literature puts efforts with the random shock variable because effort is uh, rarely observed. And in this, uh, using it on micro data from Bolivia, we show that being indigenous is one of the main sources of inequality and social expenditure contributes to the reduction of inequality, although much a more expenditure is needed to completely offset it. Similarly, having being born into a privileged family background is another important source of unfair inequality. And that is also the policies seem to go in the right direction in terms of countering the effect of these circumstances. Thank you very much. I think with that, I stop. Okay, thank you very much for the presentations. Or, yeah, I already see some questions. So. Uh, thank you very much, it was very interesting. Um, I was thinking about the last result that you showed with regards to um, family background yeah. and um, the impact, the positive impact it has and uh, if it's included with infrastructure and social components actually has a slightly negative impact. And that reminds me of this social scientist, conservative scientist that I have recently started reading his work, uh, Thomas uh, Sowell, who uh, argues that, for example, welfare state um, is uh, not helping people. I mean, it's important to to have education in family and a, and a, and a um, stable family structure, but actually giving uh, equal uh, um, minimum wage to everyone is in fact uh, has a um, back, backfire effect and uh, uh, does not help uh, especially marginalized community to thrive uh, in, the, in the community. I was wondering, what do you think about this uh, uh, I, I don't know whether you know. I have we haven't done um, uh, empirical work on that, uh, but one uh, one one point I would like to kind of highlight here is that this infrastructure expenditure and the social the two policy variables are infrastructure expenditures and social expenditures, but they are not targeted towards a particular you know these fam families with the uh, you know low level of education of parents or indigenous communities these expenditures are targeted towards the whole population so it's not uh, you know a, a target it's a, not a targeted policy variable so even if the social expenditure exp uh, uh, is is uh, is, um, is beneficial is available for all the population it seems to be you know helping the unfair, the people with an unfair circumstance uh, situation more than the people with the, with the other, in the, than the other. So here, what we are showing is that even if you have a universal policies, because, you know, in the policy variables, people in the policy literature or policy, uh, you know, um, field, people talk about conditional or targeted uh, policies as uh, versus universal programs, you know, universal education for all, in health, universal health, uh, free health access uh, for all. So the universal, these are all the effect of universal programs that we are looking at, not targeted, 
uh, towards a particular communities, even if you have a universal program that does uh, you know, go to the right, right people or right set of people are able to benefit from it uh, in terms of that seems to be, that means these programs are availed of or seem to be beneficial to the ones that are, uh, that need them the most. So that's what here it's shown empirically shown, and that's what seems to work. Now, whether the universal program of just giving out free resources, whether how much that will com compare that with a situation like I have here in terms of you know not giving them free things, but also uh, improving their surrounding factors like better schools, better hospitals, and better sanitation, better water uh, you know access, and things like that. So these seem to help, whether just distributing, you know, income to everybody, whether that will help or not compared to this, I wouldn't be able to comment on that because uh, we haven't done that comparison. Uh, so it might well, well be true that, you know, they may not help as much. It's clear that, and then it, this is a really in the spirit of making, helping people to help themselves, you know, providing education, providing good health care and et cetera, are giving opportunities for well-being so that if you give these opportunities, then people are willing to put the effort. I mean, people put the effort because the effort variable is there. So the effort is put by everybody, but the equal effort will give equal reward provided you give them the opportunities for flourishing. Yeah. Uh, hi there. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, my name is Ruth. Um, I'm doing a PhD in urban inequalities at TU Delft. Um, I'm interested in um, your infrastructure and social variables. From my understanding, they are... Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, your expenditures. Yeah, sure. So... <laughs> From my understanding, they're aggregate variables. Um, and I'm just wondering if you have any insights into if there's specific um, kind of infrastructure expend, spend, if you spend on specific infrastructure, it has more of an impact, or specific social variables, it has more of an impact. I'd be interested in like the decomposition of those effects. Yeah. You're very right. They're aggregate variables, and I, I mean, forgot to mention that all, all the outcome variables are at the individual level or household level. The circumstances variables are also at the household or the individual level, but the public policy variables are at the municipality level because we, the, for the public expenditure and social services, we don't know how much of it, as I said, goes to every individual. This is how much they spend per municipality. So that there is still variation across one is a huge variation across municipalities, but they are at the at the municipality level. Now uh, we only have this disaggregation. Definitely, I mean my conjecture is if you had a finer disaggregation of these expenditures on particular on specific things, you would you will be able to even, you know, you, you saw that some of the variables were not significant for certain things. And I think there will be much more significant Significant if you had a finer classification of the what the actual expenditure goes into, you know. So we had a general category, education and health, and that's all we had in the survey. So we couldn't get a finer classification in the, in the survey as well as from the municipalities. So we couldn't get a finer classification. But my, as I said, the hypothesis is that they will definitely improve the significance of the coefficients that we have. And that we'll be able to pinpoint to what particular mm -hmm. expenditure is responsible for you know, offsetting the effect of particular circumstances. Uh, but then the reason, as I said, the minute you want to go into these finer classifications, then you have very few countries which have these, especially in the developing uh, world. And then, uh, and then it becomes, you know, we take the same old uh, US data or other things, and then it becomes the same old story. So, the reason for one of the reasons that we, 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 we took a very crude data set, because this data set was not meant for such an analysis, a very crude data set with very you know, high level variables is to say that even with such, even if you're able to get, give, get some good outcomes, I mean, good results, even with such crude data sets, then improving a data set about data collection should be able to give much finer insights. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Thank you very much.
Yeah. Can you can you please come here? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So hi, thank you. I'm I'm Marta. I'm one of these, I guess, physicists running around <laughs> the workshop. Um, thank you very much. Especially thank you for the effort of explaining to people who are not used to these terms in a sort of more accessible vocabulary. So I was wondering, so if I understood correctly, effort is not something that you can measure. You don't have data for you model it. Is that correct? Yes. Well, I, I don't know whether I, I skipped that slide. There is the effort slide. I think I did oh. skip, skip it maybe. Okay. So we don't have one single effort variable. So as I said, we postulate that effort and uh, capabilities are by definition not directly measurable. So, uh, so for the capability variables, as you saw, we had two different uh, dimensions. And then we say we have indicators of what a good material conditions capability. So capability in the material conditions was, uh, there are many, many indicators here. And capabilities in the, in the, in the subjective well-being dimension was this. Similarly, effort, we said, we don't directly measure. But we have some partial indicators of that. What, these are the four indicators that we chose. So the age at first job, uh, uh, the, whether the person is working in a formal uh, setup or in an informal setup, whether uh, what kind of a position the person has in the occupation category, and the years of schooling. Of course, again, there may be you know, arguments in terms of whether all these are personal decisions or could they could be also been influenced. We do, we do allow for their being influenced by circumstances, but we do believe that there is a certain decision making in these, in these variables, you know, whether how many years of schooling you want to do and whether you, go to, whether you want to go to, a, of course, age at first job in a developing country context is maybe it's one of that. And then one of the referees in fact said, this came out in uh, world development. One of the referees said that maybe, you know, age at first job is may not be completely, you know, uh, under the individual control because the situation may, may be, you know, demanding that they go take up an employment for, for family sustenance and all that. But then there are still, there is still some personal decision making. So these are some variables where then personal decision making is involved. And so these are our partial, and we do never, we don't claim that these are the, you know, the only effort variable. So we account for the fact in the econometric model that these are some partial indicators of effort, and then there are some unknown effort variables. Okay, thank you. No, 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 they, they look reasonable to me. No, but the, the reason why I was asking this is that in your model, you have lots of parameters, right? It's a linear model, which is, I guess, the simpler you can, you can have. But you still have lots of parameters, right? And I wonder, so what advantage do you see at using this, this kind of models with respect to doing some simpler data analysis in which you don't have to assume that there is a linear model behind it? And just trying to find, you know, equal, so this equal opportunity, I mean, if it's, oh, equality of opportunity, sorry, I don't remember exactly the name. Yeah, yeah. Just by looking at, say, the outcome and trying to control from some variables just by randomizing data or any of these other approaches. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking that probably the outcome would be the same. But do you see like another, I mean, I know that you're an expert in this, so this is why I'm asking. So what's, according to you, the added value of assuming, having to assume that there is a linear model, when in reality, do you, you do not know what kind of model is behind this data? Yeah, okay, good question. So the first thing is that, okay, we do account for some nonlinearities because of the fact that the model is linear, looks linear, but the variables may not be necessarily in the linear form. So this may be, you can put an age squared, you can put things like that, right? So the variables may be nonlinear, but the, the impact uh, the impact coefficients are linear. Yeah. And here the measurement equations may be nonlinear, that's not. So there is a little, there is nonlinearity within the linear regression setup, within the linear structure. Uh, so, so the other way is what I was talking about earlier, where we said, uh, the two ways where we compare outcomes among different groups of individuals with different, you know, each group being uh, as identified as a set of homogeneous circumstances, uh, facing homogeneous circumstances. 
But the problem with these models, I mean, problem with this way, which is a completely non-parametric way of doing things, is that the more circumstances you have and the more classifications you have, like gender, there's only two, but ethnicity, there may be more, age, you may be different age groups. So the so if you combine all that, so then you will have to, a, circ, a type will be defined by persons of a, uh, people belonging to a certain age group, of a certain gender, of a certain ethnicity, of a certain level of education of the parent and all those. So if you combine all that into one type, then you end up having many, many types of individuals, many, many groups of individuals, then you face uh, what we call, you know, curse of dimensionality. And so then it will become hard to uh, compare the outcomes across these different groups and see where they stand at equal levels of effort. So this way, this way of doing things just as descriptive or a, a, as you said, comparison or data analysis helps when you have a fewer groups fewer circumstance variables, but the minute you want to add more circumstance variables, the regression approaches is, is useful in, de in detecting or identifying equality of opportunity or inequality of opportunity. Okay, and can I ask a short question? Yeah, and, and did you, um, do you typically check how robust it is if you remove data? So from what I understand, you just put all your data, run a regression, and look at the significance of the coefficients. But there is the question of how generalizable is your regression model. So typically people just, in other domains, say computer science yes, or physics, you remove data, you fit your model and see how well, how, what's the error that it produces on that data, or how the coefficients change if you want. I mean, it depends on what you want to look at. So do you, do, did you look at this and what are the differences in terms of like, so how much would I have to expend more if I wanted to remove inequality and opportunities or things like this? Yeah, so the different, there are differences. Of course, we did three or four variants of our model. It's in the, all in the paper. And uh, there are differences. Uh, qualitatively, the results are similar. So the direction of influence and the fact that uh, these policy variables reduce the impact of circumstances, all the qualitative conclusions hold. There's no big difference. Quantitative, of course, the numbers are different. But uh, yeah, so we, we do say that this is for this particular variant. The results I showed is one of the four variants that I have. So we do have other variants where there are qualitative, I mean, the quantitative numbers are different and uh, the, the graphs are slightly different. But I mean, yeah, it is true that there, you know, we, 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 we don't have a point, we don't claim to have point estimates. It's just to give a general idea of the range of values that, that you get in terms of your results, right? So we do have, that's why instead of looking at just the coefficients, we, we plot the distribution, the whole distribution of values that you can get. So you see the range of values that uh, that um, the impact variables and you know, all the range, the distribution of the impact variables rather than just one one. So we have the whole distribution of impacts for the different variables. And they are, I mean, they're not very far, but they are different, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, th uh, thank you for this interesting presentation. I think you empirically debunked now this uh, laissez-faire, uh, very individualistic thinking of equal opportunities. So very strong message, I think. I'm glad you now showed the, the efforts. And I'm a bit skeptical if, if you don't mix up your independent and dependent variables. So the, the efforts to me look like more outcomes of uh, what else you have shown of these opportunities, capabilities. And I'm sure you've done the statistical tests and, and checked for variance and so on, but um, I'd be curious how confident you are that, that this is really you know, showing effort that is put in. And I know this is a, a real crucial area of research. And maybe later in the discussion, we can also think about how to better and more, you know, spot on, we can measure these effort variables. Yeah, you're very right. Effort variables is one of the very, as I said, you know, maybe I don't know. I don't know of many studies who explicitly 
uh, model effort variables. They are all part of the error term. You know, in each equation, as you can see, there are these error terms. So typically, the F is outside the model. I mean, outside in the sense it's not explicitly put in. And they, and so in another paper, what we did was, we uh, this was applied to Indian data set. So what we did was, we said, we split the efforts into the effort, which are, which I mean, partial measurement of efforts, but well, before, yeah, but partial, partial measurements, and then, uh, unknown, so observed and unobserved components of efforts. And we said the observed components of efforts, which is also here, are themselves endogenous, are taken as endogenous variables. Now, whether you call them as outcomes or efforts, it's endogenous. So if you want to say that this is what they are endogenous, that is that that particular point is well taken and it is part of our model here, as well as the model for the Indian data. Uh, now, whether these are the, as I said, correct effort variables, we, we don't say these are the only or correct effort variables. We say that these are possible things that we can think of as effort variables because years of schooling, for example, is something that is typically taken as an effort variable. That is, people in all, the, all of equality of opportunity literature, people, the only effort variable that keeps coming up is the years of schooling. That is, people, know, people have take deliberate decisions of the number of years of schooling beyond the compulsory, of course. The number of years of schooling they want to do, you know, complete at the compulsory level or secondary level or beyond secondary tertiary. So that is considered as an effort variable. Uh, so we said age at first job is another effort variable because what they you can decide Again, it's it's almost similar to the years of schooling. You can decide whether you want to continue your education or you want to go to take up a job. And whether you want to go to the formal sector or informal sector, in all developing countries, the informal sector is very, very big. You know, like in Bolivia, it must be more than three quarters or something. So people can do, and we another paper, we showed that it is a deliberate decision. It is not by lack of choice that people go to the informal sector. They do deliberately decide to go to the informal sector because of the fact that, of course, it has certain disadvantages. It may not have the social security and other, other things, but it may give some flexibility. They may have two jobs and other things. So it does give other advantages that people value. So the fact whether they go into a formal employment or an informal employment is a, is a willingly taken decision. I mean, it seems so. So these are the kind of arguments that we put forward to say that these are Efforts is basically the circumstance efforts is efforts are factors that are that are within the individual within the individual control. Circumstances are beyond the individual control. What your race is, it's beyond your control. What your age is, is beyond your control. Whereas what you how many years of schooling you want to do, whether you want to go to, go to the formal sector or informal sector, are within the control, at least partially. But they are influenced by your circumstances. They are influenced by your capabilities. They are endogenous. That is clear. Yeah. I don't know whether I answered your question. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Thanks. OK, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, uh, I wanted to ask a question. So when you're talking about endogenous variables, so you can introduce an instrumental variable and do redo the panel regression. Have you done those type of things as well? And what type of yes, instrumental we do. variables? And what type yeah, of so instrumental we do variables? Have, sorry, yeah, yeah. So we do have in the circumstances so the inf instrumental variables in a simultaneous equation model, the, the advantage is that the instrumental variables are given by the excluded excess of, from each equation, right? So we do have exclusion restrictions which provide the instruments, yeah. Uh, another so question. certain circumstances do not impact certain variables. And so, I mean, certain, circ I mean, in these, the, the four circumstances are all in all the equations. But there are certain other X variables which are, which are not present in all equations. So the exclusions give us the instruments for the, for the estimation. Right. Uh, the other thing, what I understood uh, when you were doing, and it's panel regression that you're doing, right? Did you also uh, account uh, for the... Just one, sorry, one yeah. cross-section. There's no panel. Oh, no, no, only cross-section. Okay, fine. Uh, that was yeah, the confusion. Yeah, there's just one cross-section. Right, thanks. Thanks. Other questions? Okay, I, I have one, actually. So I'm also uh, a member of the physics sub-community in, uh, in this workshop. So I was curious to know whether uh, you have done similar studies or other 
uh, others have done similar studies to in different countries, uh, whether that would make sense and whether it would make sense to compare results across countries, so how you can compare and generalize, essentially. I have done myself, as I said, another, exa another empirical uh, study in India for India, Indian data. Again, of course, people, other people have done. Uh, in the multidimensional setting, I think uh, the studies are rare, but in a unidimensional, in the inequality opportunity literature, there are tons of studies. And most of them look at earnings, wages, some variant, you know, income, earnings, wages, and things like that. And they all show that there is, uh, there is inequality of opportunity most of the time. All the circumstances, most of the circumstances variables always turn out to be significant. So that is one thing that is comparable in terms of, you know, across studies. But I think it's very difficult to compare, uh, compare the, the different uh, studies across different countries simply because of the fact that the variables are not the same and the definitions are not the same. So I think what can be said is that, is that across all studies, you do find inequality of opportunities. And most of the time you can find policy variables being significant in reducing the inequality of opportunity. Uh, and conditional, as I said, whether it is universal policy policies or whether it is conditional cash transfers, like in the Mexican, we did the, an impact, we did a study of, yeah, I also did it for Mexico, as a study of the opportunities programs, which targets individuals uh, and, and uh, households, and then uh, uh, there are transfers, you know, cash transfers made to individuals who are uh, considered to be you know, poor. So there we did also a study on whether these cash transfers help to reduce the unfair disadvantage that people have. And of course, the answer is yes. And none of these studies. So the qualitatively, you can compare. There is inequality of opportunities in almost all countries, and this is developed or developing. There is no, there is no kind of big difference there, and the, the policy variables do contribute to reducing this, but they don't obviously completely eliminate it because the resources that needed will be uh, really enormous for that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, can I have a, a, a clarification? Suppose that uh, yeah. your uh, set of circumstances uh, is uh, enlarged or restricted. You get uh, some result on the effort, on the impact on the effort. Because uh, I, I suppose that your effort, not, uh, not observable, is a sort of a residual <coughs> variable. Is it like uh, total uh, factor productivity? Uh, no, the effort logic? is, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so the effort is not observable directly, but as I said, we have observable, partial observable indicators of effort. From that, these are, you see, when you assume a certain thing to be a latent variable to a B and then say yeah. that you have certain indicators of that, we put in a factor analysis model here. So each of these is a, a mini factor analysis. Yeah. The Y1 star to the Y1, uh, and then here there's an effort to the observable indicators. There's another mini factor analysis here, a third factor analysis here. So these are factor analysis variables through which we can get the factor scores on the results that I presented, the effect of effect, effect on material conditions. This is the, uh, the factor score effect, impact of the factor score, which is not observable, but we can still uh, find uh, estimate its coefficient, right? Through the factor analysis. Yeah, but this coefficient is inflated if you don't, you, you, if you forget some circumstances or not. Oh, if you f forget some circumstances, if they do yeah. act on the efforts, yes, yeah. they will be. Because then, if you, if you, for example, if you remove the indigenous one, the yeah. because of the fact that the indigenous, the impact of indigenous is not there, that's going to be kind of yeah, it's taken up by. Either yeah. the effort variable, but or by the other x variables. Yes, yeah. That's so this is a, this so, makes. If you the, omit, yeah, yeah, yeah please, yeah. sorry. If you omit a variable, the other other coefficients will be biased. Yeah, yeah. this is make or, it very yeah. very difficult to, to compare the result of, for for example for Bolivia against other countries because you are not sure that the circumstances are the same. Okay. Thank exactly. You. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That is okay. correct. Other questions, comments? Yes. I'm, I'm just uh, a little bit not convinced about the uh, measurement of effort because, uh, well, you mentioned about the years of schooling uh, as the common uh, like uh, measurement. Uh, I, 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 I'm surprised like uh, it is not heavily criticized because uh, 
because I think I think for, for I can think of, as a sociologist I can think of millions of cases, individual cases where they actually the year of schooling actually is reversed co co uh, correlated with effort. Like uh, compare uh, some someone who <coughs> was forced to drop out of high school with a. Uh, like a get get pregnant, her family can't support her. She's forced to uh, drop off high school and then do like a three shift a day, and uh, that's a lot of effort compared with someone who has a wealthy family put 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 them into college. Like they they don't need to worry anything, and they actually just party every every day through 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 throughout college. And uh, I think I think uh, if you if you measure these kind of things by years of schooling. These, these two people are actually not, the, the, if you are measuring effort, it's, it's actually uh, not really the case, I feel. Okay, so I, this, I, I agree with you, and this is exactly in our model. As you can see, the, for example, here, the indigenous take less efforts, and as you say, the circumstances, like for example, getting uh, being in a in a in a different family, a family uh, situation, will impact on the effort. That is perfectly uh, taken, and that is pr also modeled into the into the into the that is in in the model. So people with different situations, different family situations, different family wealth, different resources are going to put in different efforts. And that is in the model. And that's what we are actually, as I said, one of the, and the, that it can be done only if you have some effort variables. Because if you put the effort variable as a random error term, then you don't have the possibility of taking this influence, except to say that there is a, you know, some endogeneity somewhere. But here, because of the fact there's an explicit effort variables, we can add the influence of the family situation on the effort variable, exactly the negative effect, and you can see the negative coefficient here. So the negative effect that you're talking about can be explicitly modeled if you have explicit effort variables. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I also want to go on about this effort variable. Um, so one thing I was wondering about is an additional thing is whether uh, the impact of effort may actually also differ depending on family background, for example. So if I think of years of schooling, um, well, if I think from a so cultural capital perspective, for example, whether your uh, parents have brought you up in a way that you better know how to study, that you better know how to use the terminology that teachers like, and so on and so on, may, uh, d or may have an impact on how effective actually the years of schooling are. So for the one person, the same effort may uh, be different than for another person. So I was wondering how you think about that. Yeah, that may be true, because in fact, uh, yeah, you can interact effort with the uh, family background, for example, circumstance yeah, variables. So idea. here the effort goes yeah. like this. Mm -hmm. It says that uh, people of different, uh, well, we saw also in the case of education, people of different educational backgrounds. So people with, uh, it, it, it is normally the case that people, children of uh, educated parents tend to be pushed into making be better or more efforts than people of you know maybe a less a lower level of education and so that is seen in the effort in this effort uh, in this effort um, coefficient but then whether the what we are saying it even the what, what two pa parents uh, putting the uh, you know, pushing their children to do more effort because of their different backgrounds but given that children put the same the, the effort that they put in may even also give rise to dif different outcomes depending on the families that they are in. That is not in the model, in this model. So what we have in the model is that people, children of different family backgrounds may be putting in different efforts because of the influence of the family situation or as you said, of the parents. But then given that the effort themselves, will it give rise to different outcomes? The effort put in by these two different children, will they give it to different outcomes? Could be, and then it, it will be a question of adding the interaction on the effort variable also. Interaction of effort to circumstances. Yeah, so I would be curious which, which to know what happens do, <laughs> once you do that. Yeah, okay. Uh, I don't know. We, we yeah, didn't do yeah. that. That, that would mm. be something which we you know can explore. I mean, which could be explored. Yeah, yeah. Okay. we didn't do that. 
Okay. But we said that given the fact that we do take into account that the family situation does impact on the effort and the fact that the impact that impact can be quantified by saying, for example, if you say indigenous people put in less effort because of their family situation. So that multiplied by this will be the kind of the interaction of the effort, the indirect effort of the uh, indigenous on the, uh, on the outcome through the effort variables. Mm -hmm. So if you multiply this and this, that would give you the point minus 0. 0.112 times 0. 0.398 will give you how much the difference, the difference between uh, the effort in the in the in, non-indigenous will be this and the indigenous will be this times this right yeah. so that will be that's how indirectly you can calculate but you can also put it as i said if you want to uh, try a different variant we can put it directly on the effort variable yeah okay thank you anyone else no more comments or questions so I ask the, I see Matteo has one, okay. Actually, uh, I have a question for uh, the psychologist here. So essentially going to the other talk, the first talk, um, I think that was interesting because it was uh, tracing back uh, uh, sources of determinants of inequality to cultural aspects or so how I mean as far as I understood um, how cultural traits uh, combi can be combined in different ways uh, in a, as I say so I wanted to um, ask uh, <laughs> psychologists uh, or say People who can comment on that or can uh, give some uh, um, perspective on this uh, because I think this is an interesting dimension. Uh, of course, I'm looking at Mirta, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you want to... Uh, so Eric? The question. <laughs> no, the, question is, uh, the question is how much this perspective uh, um, is, a, um, say, is a prevalent perspective on inequality. Say, there, there is this tension between, say, uh, hierarchy, hierarchies and egalitarianism, and this is rooted in uh, cultural uh, uh, aspects. And uh, I think that is. <clears throat> um, important way of looking at it, but we can also think about it in, in wider terms. So, so why do we have those beliefs about hierarchy and, and uh, uh, egalitarian ethos? I would like to think about it more in terms of um, what is best for a collective at a specific point in time and how these different, uh, not only ideas about hierarchy and, 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 uh, and egalitarianism, um, there can be other dimensions that, that leads the collective to be more or less adaptive. In certain circumstances, it might be good to have a hierarchy. In other senses, better to be egalitarian. And of course, that and other aspects of being a collective and work together can be better or worse uh, over time, uh, and it leads us to the, down different paths. <laughs> uh, we can be stuck in one of these uh, uh, kind of semi-stable states, and then maybe the environment changes. But then we can switch over, then we switch over to another state, another state, either because we are more adaptive, or we perhaps have miscalculated or learned something in the past that didn't really work out. So we switch on to another thing, and back and forth. So that's one thing. So, no, my understanding was that uh, it was uh, thinking about these two different, uh, say, archetypes, uh, like, uh, like uh, hierarchies uh, and egalitarianism uh, as uh, hardwired in like human nature. Like, uh, I mean, uh, maybe not in hardwired, let's say, in biology, because, say, you find... Uh, 
uh, hierarchies uh, in, you, uh, in animal societies. And, uh, and then, uh, okay, you think, uh, okay, humans have developed this uh, abstraction uh, for uh, egalitarianism or things like that. I mean, how much this resonates with the way people think about, uh, say, uh, processes at the human, uh, I don't know. I'm usually kind of hesitant to talk about hardwired stuff because that's bring you down a road that, I don't know. So um, I think even in a purely kind of experiential or, or uh, learning situation, we actually learn to see that, well, some things just have to be in hierarchy. I mean, we have democratic societies, but we have hierarchies everywhere, because sometimes it's just better to solve us that way, because we cannot just have everybody decide everything at once. It's going to be slow, inefficient, and so on and so forth. So even, even if you go beyond this hardware thing, uh, any kind of learning system that starts from scratch will certainly learn that, oh, if I'm going to do this task quickly and efficiently, we need, maybe we need a hierarchy for this one. But this for the other task, we might not need this hierarchy. We need more of an egalitarian way of doing it, more consensus-based or whatever um, decision-making process for, 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 for solving that task. So I think that this talk about hardware, so I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> Even though it can be true. Uh, then, then, uh, I mean, say one way of thinking about hardware Say this hard, hard fireness is like uh, um, the way we are built from a neuroscience perspective. So, so for example, we have neuromodulators that uh, modulate uh, a lot of uh, social interactions, and there are five of them. Okay, so so there are five modes in which we we interact and uh, and and this shape our behavior, but. So this is the way I was thinking about but Thomas and so. So maybe from my own experience, I'm not an anthropologist or psychologist, but I'm working with those people. And I also always thought, okay, are people egalitarian? Are uh, people hierarchical? No, it's discourses. So we're looking at discourses, and discourses can be egalitarian, hierarchical, and we are forgetting about the individualistic discourse, which is actually quite prevalent in, in uh, global north countries. And then we can also see this flexibility. In one discourse, I might be more egalitarian, but then you switch more towards a hierarchical uh, discourse, and that's how I understood then to, to see uh, problems, challenges. Look at those from a discourse, but not connect individual persons to this hardwired, you are hierarchical, you are egalitarian. It's more really a fluid thing also. Of course, we might have tendencies towards one or another, but yeah, that's how I learned it. So I think I... Hijacked the discussion. <laughs> Sorry. I help you to further hijack it. Um, yeah. I, I, well, we month, maybe one thought from a from a sociological perspective here would be that uh, let's say in every society we have uh, authority. Um, for example, because it's just needed to get things organized. Uh, we cannot always discuss everything and so on. But a very important question is to what extent is it seen as legitimate? To what extent do people accept it? And I think in at least some theories say that uh, humans, uh, let's say, have a, a mix of fundamental needs. Uh, one of the needs is to get approved of for doing the right thing, so to say, uh, 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 get confirmation that you are living up to the norms of your society and you can get that from authorities, that's very nice. But you also have need, for example, uh, just simple basic material needs, needs for recognition by your peers and friends, uh, for affection and so on. And I think one important question in, in society is always to what extent the authorities and the authority and the hierarchy structure we have is... Uh, consistent and no, not too much in conflict with the other needs we have. Of course, it's not nice to get told what you have to do, but if you see that on the whole, it helps to have a good life in this society, 
you are willing to accept it. That would be what many people would argue. Uh, but if people had get the feeling that, and, and maybe in, at the moment we see that, that more and more people get the feeling these elites are actually not really solving the problems that we have. And on the contrary, things get worse for all of us. Then at some point that uh, legitimacy of authority declines. And I think then we are at the point that we may see an uprise of the more egalitarian uh, discourse. Yes. I, I follow the directions. I sent. I follow the direction. I sent two slides. Do. Okay. If there is time, I can. You know, this um, egalitarian versus um, hierarchy, particularly about the transition from one to the other, it might be that, I mean, if, if one accepts the basic premise, first of all, that there are these two basic modes, hierarchy versus egalitarian, uh, in people's minds, and there is a collective uh, uh, sort of transition from one to the other, which is what he was presumably talking about, quasi-steady states. And that might that transition might be because of an overshoot. So if you spend a time, you know, spend a certain amount of time in a close to one um, quasi steady state, then um, you know there is this idea that um, over a period of time, certain things get entrenched, and um, certain unproductive things or unnecessary things or things that really weigh the system down get entrenched. And um, that overshoot basically then has a reaction uh, and, um, you know, uh, causes eventually over a period of time, uh, you know, a transition uh, to away from that uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, I mean, this is one of the ideas I think broadly that Tainter has about uh, collapse of societies, that there's an overshoot um, of some kind, um, maybe of complexity or something like that, that, that causes this overshoot. So um, it could be that uh, spending long enough uh, in, uh, in a particular equilibrium, or not equilibrium, but quasi-steady state, as he calls it, um, uh, releases, I mean, you know, sort of uh, create certain vested interests and create, create certain, uh, certain uh, um, inefficiencies. I mean, I don't know if there is an economic uh, description of that, but uh, uh, you know that's it. It sounds to me that the transition is uh, possibly uh, is happening because of some some kind of overshoot that 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 is inherent in being uh, you know close to one particular uh, uh, quasi steady state. But at a more basic level, it seems to me to be somewhat arbitrary to make this kind of a classification you know as as a basis for. Um, um, for for uh, you know uh, for for discussing what's uh, uh, what's going on right um, I mean I don't know whether this classification of egalitarian versus hierarchy is that basic in our minds uh, maybe we are concerned uh, I mean so this is in part in response to your psychological question uh, uh, is that in our minds are we really concerned about hierarchy and uh, egalitarianism uh, or uh, are we concerned about some other things uh, I'm I'm not completely convinced that, that this um, classification uh, ought to be a basis of our thinking uh, of, of, of um, how things happen. Uh, you know, I'm just uh, saying that. Yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm also skeptical about it. But it just seems overly general. Um, 
categorization in two, two uh, things. And this is, I mean, it really depends on the function of hierarchy. So what do we mean? What do we mean by hierarchy? And the example was, the speaker had an example of chimps or whatever. And the hierarchy, the function of hierarchy is there to assure, to, to is, is mate control, to have control over females. That's very different than many other forms of hierarchy that we have. So one, for example, hierarchy that we don't even notice is the hierarchy in the way we learn from each other. Students naturally, <laughs> to an extent, I wish they would more, you know, listen to their professors and learn from people who they think have more expertise. Um, in decision making, we will naturally, you know, defer to you to tell us where to go for coffee. And there are, there are many, there, that's also hierarchy in a way, right? What is a hierarchy anyway? So, uh, but then there are maybe what, what we are more <laughs> against is hierarchy based on some arbitrary, culturally determined norms such as who is more virtuous, who is more moral, who has more right to some kind of benefits based on relatively arbitrary markers. I guess that's what we are revolting against. But not all hierarchies are, are as Henrik said, I mean, we need some kind of, a, a, any information processing account of any kind of uh, collective will get to some kind of hierarchy. Our chat GPT <laughs> is, is a big hierarchy, right, of, of layers in a neural network. So is that bad? Hey, uh, can I just add, uh, yeah, I, I so uh, at the beginning of the the, the hierarchy and uh, uh, egalitarian debate, I, I I do find some resonance about Chinese history, like uh, the dynasty, beginning as as kind of a egalitarian force and uh, at least promised to be, and then gradually like uh, people become corrupt and stuff, and then there's a hierarchy, and uh, the dynasty end, and like it has been go over going on like that for two thousand years. But uh, I, do, I do feel like uh, uh, the problem with this kind, kind of uh, relationship, uh, simplified relationship is sometimes actually, uh, uh, well, I, I need to uh, choose my words carefully here. Uh, so the, uh, take, take our pre, uh, like current president as the example, uh, he actually legitimized his hierarchical centralized power uh, by promoting egalitarianism. He's, 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 uh, he's claiming to, uh, to equalize the uh, redistribution from the you know, rich people to uh, like, um, normal people. But uh, he claims to do that, he has to have uh, enough power uh, and uh, each layer of government has to have enough power to force the capitalist to uh, give out their uh, resources. So it's actually kind of a paradoxy uh, development between hierarchy and uh, electoralism. Hey there. So to just add a comment, I, I, I was a little... I was a little uncomfortable with Jim Robinson's, you know, set up. Set up and I, th I agree with what was said that this this strong dichotomy between egalitarianism or hierarchy is just a, an ideal picture. It doesn't really apply. Every, every organization will have bits of both, right? And be more on one extreme or the other. So, um, but what I want to warn about, what I want to say is that in problems of inequality or hierarchy or social structure, the purely structural view, which is quite dominant, particularly in some social sciences, so you describe the structure just like Jim was doing, is creates a situation that's undecidable. This was said by some of you. You don't okay. You say, oh, well, it looks like this. Is this kind of hierarchy? Okay, and then you have to say, is it good or is it bad? Should it be different? Then you have to say, or what Mirta was just saying, for what? <laughs> Right? What is it doing? Is it doing something good or not? Good for the collective, good for the individuals, for whom? So you have to basically unpack a sense of process of what is the structure doing and uh, how is it doing it across scales from the individual agents to the collective. And then you can decide if it's doing it well or not. 
if it's freezing development and creating power in the hands of the few, or on the other hand, is organizing people like in the military or something to potentially be effective, which is a hierarchy. So I think without a sense of function and purpose of what the organization is doing, it's just completely undecidable. I'll give you some examples tomorrow in my talk. So I think it would be good for us to keep in mind this overly structural view of inequality, which we often do when we have a lot of cross-sectional data, and always be asking, what is it doing? Could it do it better? Could a different structure service it better? Is it uh, arresting dynamics and so on? Um, so to me, that helps a lot try to decide what kind of inequality and what kind of uh, quantities we should be looking at. I want just to say that uh, well, this is one of uh, the main question I have. I mean, so so say there should be an interplay between, uh, say, structure and uh, I mean, there should be some hierarchy. Uh, but, but, uh, but on the other hand, it should not be too strong to have zero mobility. So there there should be some uh, and. Um, so uh, I'd like to understand more about uh, this this issue. So so I think we have a coffee waiting for us upstairs. Maybe when we reconvene, uh, we can uh, start with the uh, Vito uh, presentation. And um, also we decided to have a slightly longer coffee break because we can interact more uh, on coffee breaks. So we maybe we reconvene at uh, quarter to five. Is it okay? I would like to just thank everybody for their questions and feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.